Okay, welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Jason Fleming. I am the chairman of uh, GI Oncology here at Moffitt. Um, and I lead a group of extraordinary people and you're gonna hear from some experts tonight in the area of colorectal cancer. Uh, before we begin, I have an announcement that, uh, that we need to get out of the way. And that is that the content tonight is not intended to be medical advice. And the viewers should consult your physician if you have any questions. Viewers should not rely on this information contained in this presentation or webinar for immediate or urgent medical needs. Additionally, if you think you may have a medical emergency, please call your physician, go to the nurse emergency department or dial 911. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay seeking care because of the information contained in this presentation tonight. Again, we're so pleased to have you here with us. Uh, before I introduce you uh, to our speakers tonight, I want to remind you, after we hear from our speakers, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions. We invite you to type your questions into a Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. With that, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Frakes. Jessica Frakes is an associate member in the Department of Radiation Oncology and a, and a, and a member of our GI Oncology program. Her clinical expertise encompasses the use of radiation therapy to help patients diagnosed with gastrointestinal cancers, including cancers of the esophagus, stomach, pancreas, liver, um, and colorectal areas. Uh, with that, I'd like to uh, ask Dr. Franks to take over the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Fleming, for that wonderful introduction, and thank you all for being here this evening. Um, I'm going to kick off the webinar talking about rectal cancer and what we can do to improve outcomes for our patients. Next slide. So what is the current problem? Well, currently, patients, unfortunately, are getting diagnosed with colorectal cancers earlier in their lives, um, and they're still being diagnosed with later stages, meaning locally advanced disease, where we have to solve the problem of the local regional disease, but also reduce the risk of this cancer spreading. Depending on the location, of the rectal cancer, that would determine what surgery is necessary for cure. And so some of these low-lying cancers may require a permanent colostomy and may have quality of life implications. Next slide. So how can we improve the current standard of care? Well, since the early 2000s, the standard of care has been chemo radiation followed by surgery and ending with adjuvant chemotherapy. What we learned from this paradigm is that there were low rates of complete response. And when I say complete response, I mean, when the surgeon resects the tumor and the pathologist looks at it, there was still cancer left in the pelvis, meaning the chemo and radiation did not take care of all of the cancer. And that distant metastasis still poses a problem for our patients. So how has that paradigm shifted 20 years later? Well, what we currently do is follow a total neoadjuvant therapy protocol or TNT. This is where we give the chemo radiation, the chemotherapy all prior to a planned surgery. Um, and the goal is to enhance that complete response and improve the cure for our patients. Next slide. What we know is with following that current paradigm, a little over a third of our patients have a complete response to the surgery, meaning a pathologic complete response. As a clinician, one of the first questions that I'm asked from our patients is who does have a complete response is why did I get surgery? And unfortunately to date, my answer is if only we could have known all the tumor was gone after treatment and we would have been able to select patients better and hopefully avoid that surgery. So to me and my colleagues on this call, this is an opportunity for future directions. This is an opportunity for us to improve the um, cure of our patients, but really focus on reduction of morbidity. Next slide. So how can we attack this problem? Well, as you know, this is a trimodality um, treatment. So there's multiple areas uh, to attack. So one is the chemotherapy. So can we target the chemotherapy based on the patient's uh, biology? Um, can we optimize that radiation dose? So currently all patients, regardless of the individual biology is getting that same dose of radiation. And we know that a third of patients have a complete response and that two thirds may have um, either varying response, meaning no response or um, you know, almost a complete response. And can we optimize that dose to really transition patients into that complete response? 
And can we see, see that tumor responding during treatment? And does that give us any insight into patient selection? Next slide. So this gives us an opportunity or time for novel therapies. Well, unfortunately, the um, old radiation machines, and I say old, we still use them a lot and they have a wonderful utility in a lot of cancers, um, but they have CT guidance. In rectal cancer, MRI is very great at seeing that soft tissue. And you'll hear from Dr. Costello more eloquently than how I stated the use of MRI in rectal cancer. But what if we have the MRI built into the radiation machine and we're able to see the cancer throughout treatment. Next slide. So can this tool lead to better patient selection? So the picture on the right is very busy, but what I want you all to focus in on is the red volume. So the top left, you see a larger volume um, circled in red compared to the bottom right. So this is a patient's rectal tumor during treatment using an MRI, and you can see that tumor regressing throughout treatment. So can we utilize the MRI in that regression to select patients um, for what dose of radiation is necessary, but also can we predict who will have a complete response to treatment? Um, RSI or GARD, so this is a in-house Moffitt um, a uh, genomic signature developed by Javier Torres Roca, one of our radiation oncologists, looking at individual tumor biology. And on the bottom, you see what's listed as rectal adenocarcinoma, and you see that diagram. And this shows you different doses of radiation to achieve a complete response. So that picture speaks for itself, different doses based on different patient tumor biology. So can we utilize this to also improve patient selection? Lastly, what about circulating tumor DNA? Do we have a marker that we can see in the blood or a blood draw to predict how a patient is responding? And so we've partnered with industry to utilize this test. Next slide. So the ongoing research here at Moffitt for colorectal cancer is utilizing all of these novel therapies, looking at genomic-based signatures, um, looking at improvement in um, imaging, so MRI capabilities, liquid biomarkers, radiomics to really predict response for our patients, determine what dose is necessary of radiation to either escalate the treatment or de-escalate the treatment, so potentially spare morbidity for our patients, um, and improve selection for rectal organ preservation. Next slide. So here's a nice uh, diagram of the ongoing clinical trial that my colleagues and I have developed um, looking at non-metastatic locally advanced rectal cancer. Patients are getting the standard of care, but really tailoring or personalizing the dose of radiation based on the tumor's inherent biology, utilizing, as I mentioned, MRI, um, circulating tumor DNA, as well as volume changes throughout treatment. And the ultimate goal is to improve that clinical complete response from a higher than one third of our patients um, so they could potentially benefit from a watch and wait approach. Next slide. So with that introduction, um, I hope um, my colleagues will um, enhance this conversation um, and show you um, the research being done at Moffitt that's to improve the cure and preserve function for our patients. So next I'll turn this over to Dr. Seth Felder. Um, he's a colorectal surgeon here at, um, at Moffitt who has extra fellowship training in colorectal diseases and cancer. And one of his main focuses um, when it, in regards to research is rectal preservation and reduction of morbidity for our patients. So with that introduction, Seth, take it over. Great, thanks Dr. Frakes. Appreciate you setting the stage. I'm happy to be here and, and thank you everyone for joining us this late in the evening. I recognize some of the names as well. So I'm, I'm glad you're here with us. And you know, this is a topic um, that's very um, near to me. It's one of the main diseases or cancers that I routinely um, treat and take care of along with our team here. And um, as, as Dr. Frakes had, had mentioned, you know, we call these rectal cancers, but from one person to the next person, there's clearly a difference. And we see that in the extent that they respond to the therapies that we um, know uh, should be beneficial. The problem is it's quite a spectrum and we have a lot to learn, but that spectrum goes from minimal to complete elimination of the cancer with the ability to perhaps actually question whether or not surgery of removing the rectum actually 
derives any additional benefit or not, or really only provides the risks and the complications and side effects without really benefiting from a cancer perspective. So we'll go into a little more detail here. And so, you know, things we know for certain, and we see this all the time, is after rectal cancer surgery, bowel function is diminished or, or it's not as good as it previously had been. It decreases quality of life. Colostomy similarly um, have a significant detrimental effects on overall quality of life. Nobody wants to have their rectum removed. And we have these two, I think, sort of uh, parallel goals here. We wanna maximize the cure, um, but preserve the quality of life. And there are two basically main priorities there, and it's hard to put them at one or two. They're both um, sort of equal. But as Dr. Frakes had alluded to, we don't know for certain which patients will be complete or an incomplete response, meaning they receive their treatments. And at the end of the treatments, we reassess, reevaluate, and see what do we think? Is it gone or not? The problem at this point is we have very little predictive tools to say this person or this tumor may have a higher likelihood than the next person with a different tumor also called, called rectal cancer. So in that way, we, we routinely treat many patients similarly when we should really be trying to work to personalize and individualize to the patient in the rectal tumor. So we currently have some tools and the MRI and endoscopy are, are probably the workhorses and the mainstays and Dr. Costello will go through the MRI. And endoscopy is also a very good tool. It's a limited um, sort of camera view of the inner lining of the rectum um, a few inches in to assess what it looks like. Does it look like there's a mass or a scar or something in between? That being said, none of these tests can tell us if there's microscopic cells of cancer in the wall or remaining in, in the area of the rectum. Unfortunately, to tell that, we really at this point only can use the test of time. Time will tell us or remove the entirety of the rectum and the pathologist under the microscope tells us. So what we're trying to understand is how, how we can develop better tools to better select patients and obviously predict who will be someone that may or be more likely to develop a complete response. And as far as circulating tumor DNA, these are sort of what we would call liquid biomarkers. Perhaps they can measure the um, circulating fragments of cancer cells in, our, in the body and can also help us select patients. Next slide. So this is just um, pinning down that point. You know, the rectal cancers that we deal with, we, we call it that, but they're all very different. So a global view that I wanna point out is that most patients with localized rectal cancer can be treated with a high likelihood of cure. Um, you know, again, the heterogeneity of the biology of that tumor though is, is sort of all over the map. You can see on that graph there that the gray line represents people that that didn't really respond very well at all or had a poor response to those preoperative treatments. And their survival and recurrence is the worst. Compare that to the blue line where the tumor went away completely. They had these preoperative therapies. The surgeon took the rectum out. The pathologist said there's no viable cancer cells remaining. And the cure rate for those patients is, is, is as good as you can get as a cure rate for having a, a fairly advanced rectal cancer somewhere in the, in the range of 90, 95% um, at five years. So what we've learned is there's a spectrum. And in fact, in this spectrum, there's perhaps up to 40%. So that's maybe a third, almost up to a half of patients may have a complete response, meaning that in half the patients, we should really be reassessing and questioning what the role of future or additional surgery is. We know it's associated with a great or an excellent survival compared to those that have less of a response. And we've learned that if you remove the rectum and there's no tumor left in the rectum, it's unclear if you've benefited the patient at all. Meaning that if the tumor, or I'm sorry, if the rectum was left in place and we thought it was a scar, all tests indicate a scar, and there's no evidence of regrowth in that area where the tumor had originated from, that patient has the same very, um, very good or high survival rates as the person that had their rectum removed without any cancer left in it seen under the microscope. Next slide. So I would just wanna point out this, there's a lot of numbers here, not that important, but if you start from the left and go to the right, you can see now 
these are some of the landmark trials that have occurred, and we base our, our evidence and our practice on this, um, this high-level scientific evidence. And so in 2001, a major trial basically proved the importance of radiation. And if you go all the way to the right, the sequences have been modified, but they're all similar now. They basically, com they're comprised of radiation and chemotherapy. And where that sequence is, is has been something that's been studied over thousands of patients. But what you can see is that the DM means recurrence somewhere else in the body, distant metastasis, which is really the driver of, of survival in rectal cancer, has been or remained fairly steady over the last two decades. So, you know, the question remains, have we made a significant um, have we made significant progress over the last decades? And, and I think we have, certainly, we've learned quite a bit, but I think the improvements have been small percentile changes in this, at least in this aspect. Next slide. But what we've noticed throughout these last two decades, again, starting at that trial all the way from 2001 to the most recent one in the green, we've learned that these sequences, how they're manipulated, the timing intervals between how, how they're administered has resulted in a rate of somewhere between 20 to 40% of patients receiving therapy, going to surgery, having no residual cancer or tumor left in that specimen. And so that's where our trial or where our research is interested in, where we're looking at something novel, um, separate from all these other types of trials. And I'm going to go into that in the next slide here. Next. So if you, if you see the uh, second line there, chemotherapy agents and the sequences of the treatments have been studied extensively, thousands of patients. And chemotherapy is our critical component of any cancer treatment. Um, but despite the multiple agents that have been tested, none of them have really altered that percentage that I was showing you, which is the driver of overall survival, which like we mentioned is one of the um, you know, utmost priorities, cure the cancer, survival, and quality of life. What has not been studied is the dose of radiation to the pelvic tumor and the lymph nodes around it. Everyone at this point receives the same dose. And like Dr. Frakes had showed, there clearly is heterogeneity there. There's some tumors that are more sensitive. There's more, some that are more resistant. And we know that because some tumors at time of resection are gone and some have had no response at all. And so to give everyone the same dose does not seem like the appropriate thing to do. And, and what we're working on here is trying to personalize that through a novel approach of intra-treatment assessment of the evolution of the tumor while it's being treated to select patients. Next slide, our slide. And this is just going back, you know, this is a more surgical type of uh, effect slide of what rectal cancer surgery uh, often uh, results in. And on the left, you can see if you've had radiation and then surgery, about the red and the yellow, 93% of people are going to have um, impairment in their, in their evacuation function of stool, and it's going to affect their quality of life. And similarly, if you look to the right, this is a survey of patients. Well, what do patients want? Patients want to be cured. They want to have bowel function that's adequate and not have a colostomy. So these things line up. It's pretty clear. People don't want an ostomy or bad bowel function. Um, and they want to be cured. And can we accomplish those two goals simultaneously? Next slide. So before we get to the next slide, this is an interesting one to, uh, slide as well. As to patients and doctors taking care of rectal cancer patients, patients want to preserve the rectum. They don't want to have rectal surgery. And in this study, at least, patients were willing to accept 20% increase in overall and local recurrence and a reduction in survival that was significant, 20%, um, if they were able to preserve the rectum, okay? And so physicians accepted a much lower risk, but that just shows there's, a, there's maybe a disconnect between what you know, a doctor may think and what the patient actually is aiming to achieve with their care. Next slide. Next slide, please. So I always put up this uh, book. This is an 18th century uh, surgeon from Scotland, but I, I sometimes consider myself the reluctant surgeon because 
I'll see a large tumor, they'll have treatments, and it will then regress or become what appears on the right side, a scar. That's an endoscopic picture. And then the MRI, which Dr. Costello will review, can, can uh, confirm or clarify the extent of disease. And at this point, it's always been sort of a reflexive process to do surgery. At this point, watch and wait or observing, not taking out the rectum and deferring surgery is, is hopefully checking off those boxes of curing and, um, and maintaining quality of life. Next. So you can see here, watch and wait, which is what we call not operating immediately and, and reassessing. This is uh, a clear area of intense research and the, you know, the publications are exponentially increasing. Next slide. And so just as a, an example, um, we have a gentleman here with a very low rectal tumor. Um, it, it's almost uh, at the level of the anus and it's locally advanced. Um, and he was treated within the context of this trial with radiation that was dose adapted to um, try to increase that rate of a complete response. And, you know, he's not quite through with therapy, but so far it's encouraging and promising. And, you know, it, it speaks to what his priorities were, which was to cure and hopefully avoid a colostomy. And now I'll turn it over to um, Dr. Freaks and Dr. Costello. Thank you so much, Dr. Felder, for that um, excellent discussion on surgical implications for rectal cancer. Next, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Dr. James Costello. He's an associate member of Di Diagnostic Imaging and Interventional Radiology. He brings a unique skill set for research utilizing MRI for clinical applications. So with that, I'll turn this over to Dr. Costello. Thank you very much, Dr. Frakes and Dr. Felder. I very much appreciate that introduction, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, talk with you this evening about MR imaging of the rectum. And so why would we choose MRI to image the rectum? Well, it's an extremely powerful technique, which is able to produce images which have exquisite soft tissue contrast. And with that exquisite soft tissue contrast, it's able to take a structure and to differentiate the different tissue types. Moreover, MRI of the rectum is capable of producing functional and dynamic imaging, which enhances our ability to be more accurate and precise in our diagnosis. And as people have often discussed, one of the other benefits of MRI is the fact that it does not involve ionizing radiation, as is the case with CT. Next slide, please. So an MRI generates images by exciting a hydrogen proton in the structure of interest, and then watching as that hydrogen proton returns to realignment with the MRI scanner. And we can describe that realignment process in many different ways. And that's what generates the wealth of images that you create with an MRI exam. Next image. So what are the advantages of MRI specifically for those patients who have a rectal tumor? Well, it's able to accurately localize the tumor. Is the tumor within the sigmoid colon or is it within the midrectum? And that has very important treatment implications as far as how Dr. Felder and Dr. Frakes and their team will choose to personalize that patient's care. It's able to more accurately stage the patients to determine where that rectal tumor has extended in regards to beyond the outer wall of the rectum, and does it involve any adjacent structures? All said and done, MRI imaging of the rectum creates a wealth of information that really empowers Dr. Frakes and Dr. Felder and their team to better treat the patient and to do so in a way that potentially will have lower treatment effects and long-term sequela. Next slide. As mentioned, MRI of the rectum is able to accurately localize the tumor. And we're able to do that through the exquisite soft tissue contrast and the ability to identify certain anatomic landmarks, as you see here, which is the sigmoid artery takeoff that helps us distinguish the sigmoid colon from the upper rectum. Next slide. And as this slide here shows, we're also able to create and identify other anatomic landmarks so we can distinguish, in this case, a patient that has a tumor within the sigmoid colon, 
from a patient that has a tumor within the rectosigmoid colon, from a patient that has a tumor here within the upper rectum itself. And as mentioned, where these tumors are localized very much governs the treatment options for those patients and allows us to better tailor their care. Next slide, please. So I think probably the best way to explain the power of MRI is to discuss an example of a patient who presented here at Moffitt who had blood in his stool. And this patient had uh, a colonoscopy that was performed outside where they placed a camera into the rectum and looked at the tumor itself and were able to identify that this tumor was in the mid to lower rectum. They took samples and were able to determine that this was consistent for moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma. Next slide, please. So in this case, patient's case, they ended up performing a CT exam. And as you can see here on the CT exam, you can see that there's thickening here of the mid rectum. And if I show you here the sagittal image, you can see that there's thickening here of the mid and lower rectum. But in the case of CT, it doesn't really give you a lot more information as far as what else is involved, where that tumor has extended to. Are there potentially lymph nodes involved? It doesn't provide an encapsulated and complete picture as far as the staging of the patient. So in this case, we performed an MRI of the rectum. Next slide, please. And here you can see the benefit of the exquisite soft tissue contrast of MRI and the ability to distinguish adjacent structures. And here in this patient's case, they had a tumor of the mid to lower rectum. And you can see this kind of hazy soft tissue here that is extending into the mesorectal fat. And that is important information as far as how to stage this patient and how to tailor their care. Also, it's able to see here on the sagittal image that there's involvement here with the internal anal sphincter. Once again, important and critical staging information. Next slide, please. On these images here, you can see that this tumor has extended to the puborectalis sling, but doesn't involve it. And the fact that we can distinguish that the tumor has not invaded into that muscle is critically important in how to accurately stage them. And here on this slide here to the right, we can see that the tumor extends to the internal anal sphincter, but does not extend into the intersphincteric fat or the external sphincter. Once again, critical information that the CT exam would not be able to provide. Next slide, please. And lastly, we can see in this patient's case that there's involvement with a lymph node here. This lymph node looks very heterogeneous. It's got some ill-defined borders to it. And in particular, it's got kind of a rounded and indistinct appearance, all signs that this has uh, disease involvement. And while we're able to distinguish that there's disease involvement here in case of this lymph node, we're also able to identify that there's no disease involvement here within this vasculature, within the mesorectal fat, or within this mesorectal fascia here on the right. Once again, information that would be difficult to gather from just a CT exam. Next slide, please. In addition to the exquisite soft tissue contrast, MRI also has the ability to generate quantitative imaging biomarkers, which really augment and supplement our diagnostic accuracy. We're able to create metrics as far as perfusion kinetics and how the contrast passes from the vessels to the tissue itself. And we're also able to generate quantitative imaging markers as reflected by these T1 and T2 maps that can be followed from one exam to the next and see if the patient is responding. Next slide, please. As you can see here, Moffitt is really at the cutting edge of research for patients with rectal tumors. And we've recently begun our adaptive radiation trial uh, for which we've uh, enrolled uh, a couple of patients at this point. But this ability to evaluate the success of this adaptive radiation trial really depends upon our ability to accurately stage these patients, which is what we do with MRI. And we perform MRI exams both before treatment, during treatment, and after treatment. And ultimately, what we're driving at with this research and this approach is to see, can we achieve better outcomes for our patients 
And can we identify patients who maybe have responded so well that they can avoid surgery? And while we're currently awaiting the results of this trial, all the results to this point look extremely promising. Next slide. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Costello, for providing some insights um, into MRI and how that's utilized for rectal cancer. At this time, I want to take a moment to introduce one of our partners here at Moffitt, David Curry. David is with the Moffitt Foundation, and he partners with the GI program to ensure that we receive the research dollars we need to get clinical research off the ground and make advances in cancer treatments to help all of our patients. If you'd like to learn more about how you can help, please feel free to reach out to David, um, and he'd be happy to answer your questions, and you see his contact um, information on this slide. Um, David, would you like to say a few words? Yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Franks. I, I appreciate that very much. Um, it's a... I, first, I want to thank everybody for joining tonight. I know you, uh, your time is valuable. There's a lot of things you could be doing, but you chose to spend some time uh, with us this evening in our discovery series. So thank you for joining. And also, I, I, I want to mention the fact that um, I want to thank two of my colleagues in the foundation, Stacy Price and uh, Tom Procopio. Uh, they are kind of working behind the scenes, and they've been working on this for weeks to, to make this happen. So I want to make sure that I give a shout out to them. Um, What's happening with this GI team at, at Moffitt and, and these not just three, these three tonight who are speaking, but the GI team as a whole, uh, they are um, pushing the boundaries of research. And in, in the process, they're discovering new treatments for colorectal cancer patients. Uh, they're extending and they're saving lives. And I think that's probably some of the most noble and important work uh, that could ever be done. And with this, um, with this research, the most important thing that I could say to you is that um, private philanthropy plays a very important role in what they're doing. Uh, so if you would like to explore ways that, that you would uh, want to support what they're doing and the work that they're doing, uh, please contact me uh, at your convenience and uh, we'll, we'll get you the right answers and we'll get you set on the path of, of supporting this important work. So with that being said, we're going to move into the uh, Q&A session. It's become our most popular part of the uh, program. And so, Dr. Frakes, I'll turn it back over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, David. We really do appreciate all that philanthropy does to make research possible and bring our ideas to our patients. Um, now, what everyone, as David mentioned, this is usually the most exciting part for all of our participants. So I really encourage you all to please ask questions in the Q&A, and I will go ahead and read those questions and address those to our faculty members um, and hope we can have some engaging um, conversations. Um, so the first question, I will uh, add this for Dr. Felder. So Dr. Felder, the first question, um, someone in the audience had asked, what are the survival rates for those patients that you determine cannot have radiation or chemo because of other issues and can really only have surgery um, on their tumor? Sure, so <clears throat> just to get a also, uh, an understanding, you know, the colon and the rectum are all one contiguous organ uh, of the GI tract. And so the rectum is what we consider usually the last 15 centimeters to the anal opening. And colon tumors are generally not treated with radiation. Okay, those are usually surgical or chemotherapy treatments. Rectal tumors are unique in that they're in the pelvis. And so they're confined into an anatomic space that makes the risk of removing the tumor um, successfully lower because it's harder to do, and also coming back in the site where it was removed, meaning the pelvis, um, higher than a colon cancer. And we know that radiation reduces that risk. Um, so that question is a little difficult to answer because it, it, it matters um, in the details. And those are the details that Dr. Costello was talking about, about the MRI. So like I had also alluded to, a rectal cancer is not just a, you know, a rectal cancer blanket. Um, you know, it, it's, it's individual. So is it in the upper, the mid, the lower rectum? What's its relationship to critical structures? Um, not only up and down, but also on the sides because it's confined in this tight space. Um, and how long or how, how far it's actually gone through the wall of the rectum and broken through the rectum. So these are all um, important considerations. Now, 
there is certainly a role for upfront surgery. Um, I think that um, depending on those details, it, it may or it may sometimes be even a, a better option because although surgery, I say, is is um, fraught with some morbidity, meaning quality of life problems, it's additive to radiation. And so if you can subtract a treatment like radiation, we would expect that the functional outcome might be better. And so in carefully selected patients that have advanced disease in the pelvis, an upfront resection is, is certainly reasonable. I would tell you that the um, across the board, the local recurrence rate would probably be higher in those individuals since we have learned that um, preoperative radiation treatment decreases that, that risk um, for those patients. Hopefully that answers it. Awesome. Virtually. I think you bring up some great points, uh, Dr. Felder, as it relates to the location, separating colon cancer from rectal cancer, and also um, where in the rectum it's located. That also has implications for um, responses and with surgery alone. So thank you so much for your insights. Um, next question I'd like to um, ask Dr. Costello. So if a patient um, is diagnosed with a colon or a rectal cancer, what is the benefits of coming to a center like Moffitt Cancer Center for their imaging? Thank you very much for that great question. And so I think there's several benefits for coming to a, a cancer center for your imaging. Uh, first and foremost, we have uh, state-of-the-art equipment, which allows us to generate the best possible uh, imaging exams. And in particular, our imaging exams are always up to date uh, based upon the criteria um, that is set forth um, by the disease focus panel from the Society of Abdominal Radiology. So you know you're getting the exam, which is really the most appropriate and the best uh, designed at this particular point in time. Uh, furthermore, our radiologists are all body fellowship trained. And in addition to that, we have radiologists who have additional training as provided by accreditation from the American College of Radiology and the Society of Abdominal Radiology to specifically read MRI of the rectum. And many of these radiologists that we have here are in fact members of that expert disease focus panel that determines what the imaging protocol would be for MRI rectal exams performed throughout the country itself. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Costello. Next question I will uh, send to Dr. Felder, um, and then I promise I'll take some for myself as well. But the um, next question um, for Dr. Felder would be, um, are you aware, or can you please give some insights into studies that have been done that compare the quality of life between patients that have, uh, have had LAR surgery, required a temporary ileostomy, and then have had it reversed um, versus opting to continue with the ileostomy? Thanks, that's a great question. Um, the short answer is I'm not sure of a study that compared those two sort of uh, arms of patients, but what is clear is that an ileostomy, for, for those of you that are not familiar, is, is the intestine or the small intestine before it enters into the colon being brought up to the skin level to evacuate into an appliance um, so that it doesn't pass through into the colon, uh, down through, where the colon has been now reattached to the very lowest part of the rectum typically. And the reason that that is performed is because that connection of the colon that is freed up and then hooked together, like essentially a pipe, has a statistical risk of leakage. And although that rate is low, um, it's not really that modifiable, meaning there's not a lot of things that patients can do to alter that percentage. There's not a lot of technical surgical things to alter that percentage. And so we know that if there's a leakage uh, and there's no ostomy in front, we know that stool leaking out can be a life-threatening uh, emergent issue. And, and the severity of infection tends to be much less if there's an ostomy there. Now, an ostomy has its own set of problems, okay? They're, they're, they can leak, they can be high output, they can cause electrolyte problems and, and so forth. So it's, it's, you know, trading one bad for another bad potentially, and the majority of people do not leak. So it's been argued, you know, selectively, should we not place ostomies? And, and that is the practice, although what, what 
the strongest predictor of, of having a, a problem with a connection, meaning the colon connected to the rectum, is a connection that's low in the pelvis. And these are unfortunately almost all low in the pelvis. So they're essentially removing 90% plus of the rectum and connecting it to the very last portion or the top of the anal canal. And if you look through all the studies, the greatest risk factor is the height or the distance from, from the anal opening of the connection. That's, that's the strongest predictor. And anatomically, that's just sort of what's necessary to do a proper cancer operation. I don't know the answer to the original question, but there have been certainly a lot of studies about comparing people that do have a connection to those that are unable to undergo a connection and have a permanent colostomy. That means that the tumor was so low down that it was on or near those muscles that control holding stool and continence. And so to get that tumor removed successfully with a clear edge, it requires cutting through those muscles, which then requires um, basically the colon to be brought up through the skin and evacuate into a colostomy appliance permanently. And although there is certainly a detriment in quality of life, um, for any person, it's, it's people adapt and are very resilient. And it's been studied head to head in a lot of uh, literature to suggest that the quality of life is actually very similar for those that have been hooked together and people that have a colostomy. And so, in fact, some people um, and some studies suggest that a colostomy holds a higher quality of life because of the bowel dysfunction that's associated with those connections of the colon to the low rectum. Awesome. Thanks so much, Dr. Felder. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, answer two questions that have very similar um, uh, discussions in here. And please, Dr. Felder, Dr. Costello, chime in if there's something you want to add. Um, but two of the questions are really focusing on stage four cancers, um, where there's been metastasis to the liver or to other areas that have had either, you know, Y90 or liquid radiation to the liver or ablations um, done and have been on either, you know, chemotherapy to keep the disease in control or have been kind of on observation. And the questions really kind of, um, I think, hone in on, are there new novelties that can be utilized in, in their care? And so, you know, as, you know, Dr. Fleming mentioned at the beginning, please talk to your physicians, but as a whole, you know, I think you could ask if there's been, you know, foundation one testing or looking at, you know, genomic profiles or any targeted agents that potentially could be used for your care. Um, and also potentially, is there a role for that um, circulating tumor DNA to see changes if you're not seeing anything on imaging? And so a lot of times we utilize tumor markers and we utilize imaging to determine when systemic therapy is used or not. Um, and so having a discussion about um, you know, that CT DNA, I would encourage you to do to see if that's a possibility for your specific cancer. Um, and if there's any targeted agents um, based on um, specific, you know, foundation one testing or other um, uh, pathology testing. Um, so I hopefully I've answered, there was two questions specifically in that stage four population. So hopefully that was um, some insights for you. And I don't know, Dr. Felder, Dr. Costello, if there's anything else you all would like to add. That was um, a good summary. You know, the you know in stage four disease, which is obviously um, a different topic. Uh, yeah, I would I would I would agree with you. You know, there are certainly molecular testing. You know, there's targeted agents um, uh, potentially depending on some of those molecular um, results. Um, most of the time, there's not an actionable mutation or a finding, but if there is, it can be significant um, and, and substantial. And so you would need to know that to, to select the best treatment. And so the medical oncologists typically are, are um, you know, ordering, there's a variety of these types of tests to help guide their decision-making as, as far as what, what treatments, as well as perhaps what trials you may be eligible for as well, because there are a lot of trials for people that have had multiple initial lines of, of chemotherapies um, and may not have responded well or progressed. Um, you know, there's, there's multiple new agents that are always being tested. And so I'd urge you to, to look for that too, if um, you haven't. 
Yeah, and to piggyback on that question, there's there's been some questions. Um, the difference between a genomic profile, so more of that foundation one testing versus the liquid biopsy. Um, so I don't know, Dr. Felder, if you want to talk about the differences between that um, or Dr. Costello. Well, yeah. So so genomic testing is is testing. It's it's testing the person's basically what you're born with, your, your genes, to see if there's anything that was passed down or, or heritable. Um, that's usually uncommon in colorectal cancer. That accounts for about 3% of patients um, and in rectal cancer, even less. So most patients do not have that. The other thing that they're looking for in molecular testing is the tumor. What type of mutations are on these tumors? Colorectal cancer, has a, a pretty standardized kind of repertoire of mutations. So it's pretty well characterized. Um, there are agents that are, that are specifically targeted to specific mutations or more, more importantly, there are mutations that will predict um, resistance to certain chemotherapies. So you wouldn't want to have toxicity from a treatment if you knew that it would unlikely be a benefit. Liquid biopsies are all over the map. It's um, so, Liquid biopsies, there's different forms, and these are medical oncologists that are more um, expertise in these because they're ordering them. But there are ones that profile, um, that can get the genetic data um, from the tumor that could be circulating in the blood. Okay, the, the technology has gotten to that point. What we, what we are looking at, and specifically when we say liquid biopsy, is the most common um, tumor marker for colorectal cancer is something called the CEA level. The CEA level is a poor test. In fact, in 50% of people that are diagnosed at time of diagnosis, the CEA is actually normal, um, even though we know a tumor is there. So what, we, what we're looking at in which the next generation of biomarkers are and these liquid biopsies are something called uh, Signatera. Um, and what they do is they take the tumor and, and the patient's blood and they, and they basically profile the tumor for... 15 mutations within that tumor, and it's unique to that tumor and to that person. And so that it's measured at sequential iterative um, time points as they either go through therapy or get treatments to monitor response or progression. And so, you know, we're using it in a different context here, um, not in stage four um, disease, which is metastatic disease escaped out from the primary site. We're looking at it as a more predictive um, um, test of a responder and as well as a way to select a responder because like we said before, we're never quite sure there's no microscopic cancer cells in there from these really high quality MRIs that give a lot of data, the endoscopy that magnifies it 70 times, you still cannot tell unless you have a microscope and, and, and the piece of tissue is out. Are there other mechanisms that are less invasive? And this is one avenue that we're exploring. Great. Dr. Costello, I have another question for you. Um, what advice would you give a patient or someone that has a recent um, diagnosis before embarking on treatment? So I think what makes us so successful here at Moffitt is how well we work as a team. And so uh, earlier, uh, Dr. Frakes had asked me the question of why you would get your imaging here. And, you know, an additional answer to that question is I work so closely with Dr. Felder and Dr. Frakes that I have a very good understanding of what they're looking for as far as how best to treat these patients. And so when they order an exam and they're looking for information within my report, there's certain things that they want me to address and certain questions that they want me to answer. And so the fact that we all work extremely well in a multidisciplinary setting where we're all very much dependent upon each other and we all closely interact, it allows us to provide a better quality of care to the overall management of the patient. And I think that in of itself is really one of the overwhelming benefits for being treated at a cancer center such as Moffitt. Wonderful. I have a couple questions um, that are related to Dr. Felder and, and more of a surgical approach. And so the first question I'll ask Dr. Felder really has to do with the role of ESD and EMR um, in colorectal cancer um, as another avenue to spare the colon. 
Yeah, definitely. This is um, advancing. Um, and I think sort of our colleagues in the eastern part of the globe, mainly um, Japan and South Korea are ahead of us in this regard. But these, these are advanced endo endoscopic approaches. And similarly, they're, they're weighing the question of what's the balance between cure and quality of life. So ESD and EMR, for those that don't know, are at the time of colonoscopy, there's instrumentation and they're, they're pretty good, but they're limited in the ability to, to use things and manipulate tissues because it goes through a, a several foot long flexible tube and um, it's hard to manipulate things essentially. So they've created an additional um, type of technology where instead of just, for instance, taking a little bit of a forceps and pulling something off or a snare and, and um, scraping it off the lining of the colon or the rectum, they're able to sort of burrow a little deeper into the wall of the colon and the rectum because it is made of multiple layers, um, which you can only see really under the microscope and sort of skive it out or um, you know, uh, remove it, saucerize it out. The reason why that's a very favorable technique if it can be done successfully and it requires patient selection because some are not good candidates depending on the type and size and location. Most people, if they have an early tumor, meaning a very early and it was recognized, you know, maybe they were getting a screening colonoscopy and you said, you know, here's something. It, there's a high likelihood of curing that patient with doing one of those procedures rather than what the mainstay would be, which is a, a formal surgical resection of that area of the colon or rectum. And the balance there is, well, we're never quite sure if we just kind of remove it like that, if there could be cancer cells still in the, in the wall of the colon or rectum, as well as the lymph nodes around the colon or rectum, those are really the first drainage sites, but we can estimate it. And that estimation is quite low usually. It's usually in those very early lesions, less than 10% risk that there could be residual cancer left around that site, maybe in the lymph nodes. And so what that equates to is a hundred, say a hundred people that have that issue. If you took a hundred people to surgery, 90 of them would have already had been cured by that procedure, but they're all subjected to the risk of that operation. 10 though, you may have helped. And so it's, it's for each patient, it's a balance and it, it is critical to assess not only radiographic um, findings, but also histologic findings. So the pathologist is telling us things um, to make those decisions on what's maybe the best option for a given person and their given tumor. All right, so I know we've got about seven minutes left. I'm gonna try to get through a couple more questions quickly. So we'll, we'll try to keep the discussion um, a little bit shorter to, to try to answer all of your all's questions. Um, so this is another one, um, you know, I believe for Dr. Felder. And the question really relates to, I know, you know, the discussion is colon and rectal cancer. And so if someone can have a surgery without having radiation prior, um, does that lead to better quality of life? And does the anastomosis held up, hold up better um, if the tissue has not been radiated. So um, Dr. Felder, if you could quickly answer that question for us. Sure, the short answer is yes. And, and you're the radiation oncologist, <laughs> so you would know, um, but it's additive. And there's been um, studies that demonstrate it, radiation with surgery, worse quality of life than just surgery. Um, in fact, there, are, there is a study that's already accrued over a thousand patients and it's been closed for over a year that asks just that question. Can you instead give chemotherapy and avoid just radiation for everyone um, and move forward with surgery uh, instead of irradiating like we typically would do? And the results are not yet known. Um, we'll know the answer in a couple of years. Great. So I'm going to try to lump for our last question. And again, I really do appreciate you all asking such thoughtful questions. Um, if we were unable to get to your question tonight, um, I promise someone from our team will follow up with an answer to you. So we do really appreciate you spending that time and um, typing in your questions. So, so stay tuned. I promise we will get back to you guys. Um, but the last question that I'll, I'll answer, I'm going to lump a bunch of questions together, but a lot of it has to do with the clinical trial, um, the accrual, the response, 
disease? And how do we know or if there's specific clinical indicators that would suggest a tumor does not need to be surgically removed after chemo and radiation? Um, and so this clinical trial has been open just for a few months. Um, we've accrued at this point likely three patients. Um, and so far, as we said earlier, we're seeing very early encouraging results and we're very um, cautiously optimistic and excited um, to see the trial through. Um, and to answer the specific questions about clinical indicators, um, Dr. Felder, Dr. Costello, our medical oncology colleagues in the team really follow strict guidelines looking at the MRI. Um, so Dr. Costello's expertise at reading that MRI is imperative, as well as the visualization through FlexSig. Um, and so that's where Dr. Felder, one of our GI um, colleagues, looks at that tumor during the endoscopy and sees if there's a scar or what that looks like at the time of visualization. And so we're utilizing both the MRI and the um, visualization to determine um, if patients are eligible for that watch and wait. Um, and the results, as Dr. Felder mentioned in his presentation of the watch and wait has been increasing exponentially over the years. And the encouraging results is that, you know, to date, it doesn't seem to be a difference in overall survival in patients that are on a watch and wait protocol and are um, very vigilant of coming um, as indicated, which sure is frequently um, to evaluate that tumor. Um, and so I think that, you know, with close follow-up, those outcomes um, are equivalent. Um, so with that, I want to be mindful of everyone's time. Um, we're getting close to that seven o'clock time frame and, and really do appreciate you all um, coming and being here with us tonight. We hope you found this informative um, and we really do appreciate your continued support um, as we work together to rev revolutionize um, cancer care and really provide um, the best outcomes for our patients and stick to our um, mission here at Moffitt, the prevention and cure of cancer. So again, thank you all so much for being with us tonight. Thank you.